I, I ran through those stairs and I've been through to that uh, control room, exactly where Judy Foster is. So it's, it's really, really total, total fun for, for me to, to rewatch this. <laughs> I am Anka Konstantin, a professor of physics and astronomy at James Madison University. I'm mainly an astronomer, astrophysicist. I am studying the way galaxies form and evolve, and in particular, I'm focusing on galaxies that have actively accreting supermassive black holes in their centers. And today, we're going to break down telescope scenes in movies. Contact, the signal scene. Right, so with that detection, um, she is uh, trying to get signals from extraterrestrial life, but radio astronomers don't listen to anything that is airways, right? So that's not actually what's detected, the electromagnetic radiation that has the, the radio frequency or wavelength. Any detection like this, and even the ones that SETI do right now with their uh, current program for detecting um, yeah. extraterrestrial life, they have computers that scan simultaneously like millions of signals. So doing these things like, you know, in real time, just kind of feeling the signal, that doesn't really happen. But it's fun. Right ascension, 18 hours, 36 minutes, 56.2 seconds, declination plus. Uh, so this is the Very Large Array, that's the name of the observatory, or the telescope, which is an array of radio dishes near Socorro in New Mexico. And they're used to detect radio signals from everything. I used uh, them to study some interacting galaxies, where the neutral hydrogen is and how that's distributed within those galaxies, is that's telling us a lot of things about maybe how gas is distributed, how the gas moves, uh, what's its density, temperature, stuff like that. In the solar essence, that's only people who are Confirm! Right ascension, 18 hours, 36 minutes, 56.2 seconds. So when she's very frantically saying in a walkie-talkie while driving the car towards the control room are the coordinates. So basically the position in the sky, they're called right ascension and declination. They're basically the projection on the, what we call celestial sphere, which it's an imaginary sphere that is uh, surrounding the Earth. And the coordinates are basically the projection of the uh, longitude and latitude on the surface of the Earth on that a celestial sphere. It's giving us a way of saying, there is that object that I need to observe now, and it has those two coordinates. Did you copy? I want you to go off axis on 27 the second we're there. <laughs> I, I ran through those stairs, through the, uh, and I've been through to that uh, control room, exactly where Judy Foster is. So it's, it's really, really total, total fun for, for me to, to rewatch this after, I, after I've been there. Uh, it's amazing. I love it. Forget about it and hold the cue. Gravity, the Hubble maintenance scene. Hot. System is ready to reactivate. Hubble telescope engaged. Upgrade fully functional. So Hubble Space Telescope is a uh, is an observatory, is a, is a telescope uh, that's orbiting Earth and is taking data, observing um, the deep ends as deep as it could, because now we're going to have James Webb's Space Telescope going even deeper of the universe. Congratulations. Kick back. Take the rest of the day off. <laughs> so why do we have space telescope as opposed to just the ground space telescope? One of the main ideas is going above the atmosphere. So as the light comes through the atmosphere, atmosphere being made of basically molecules of, say, water, CO2, they will scatter the light. And so the light coming from, say, a, a point source of light will not arrive at a ground-based telescope as a point source is going to show all that dance, the scatter that, that uh, light uh, happens to go through while it meets the molecules. Hubble Space Telescope also has 
instruments that observes the universe in the ultraviolet, near UV, ultraviolet, and also infrared. The atmosphere of the Earth, thank goodness, does not allow ultraviolet light, right? Otherwise, we would be kind of fried. But there are sources in the universe that emit in ultraviolet, and, and we wouldn't be able to see those if we did not have space telescopes. And it's, it's definitely not about getting closer to anything. Things are so far away that just being above the atmosphere is not going to change the game. Card is up. Uh, now that's a negative. I'm afraid we're getting nothing on this end, Doctor. Try again. No, still nothing. Yeah, so the, the astronauts on the servicing missions, they were prepared to repair some things. I think it was the gyroscopes, repair or replace some solar panels, and also replace instruments themselves, like the detectors. I know the last servicing mission uh, added a, a new spectrograph, the cosmic origin spectrograph, and repaired two others and removed some of the old ones. We're still learning a lot from it, thanks to these um, servicing missions. So the, the space de uh, debris is really uh, an increasing concern for everything that's out there, including the International Space Station or the Hubble Space Telescope. They travel really fast. The speeds can be as fast as tens of thousands of miles per hour. And so at that speed, like even a, a, a flake of paint is going to cause damage uh, to a whole telescope defunct satellites, like all kinds of pieces, and, and, and there are fewer bigger than smaller. But as I said, even the, the tiny ones, like uh, a flake of paint, and there are millions of those out there, they are able, at the speeds at, their, at, at which they, they travel, they can cause tremendous damage. Hasty, can you please turn that music off? Kowalski, other problem. The dish, positioning scene. So this uh, Parks radio telescope, which is in Australia, they needed to move the radio dish from, it was parked, you probably noticed, was parked pointing up, and it needed to move so that it followed the location of the moon. A reason for that was the uh, moon landing by the Apollo mission by NASA. <laughs> So I, I love to see how how the the movie portrays just how big this skeleton of metal which the telescope is. Now the Green Bank Telescope, which is much larger actually than the Parks Radio Telescope. And the Green Bank Telescope is just two hours away from us in, in West Virginia. And that's like a football field size stadium and that's stirring. And that's actually the largest stirrable thing on the surface of the Earth, period. So it's amazing. Just go there and see it. Zenith, 59, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 60, 01. Hold it there. There were two truly unfavorable things that happened to that kind of uh, observation. One was relative to the location of the Parkes radio telescope, the moon was really low in the sky. And so you probably noticed, right, that zenith angle of 60, like kind of hitting 60 hardly and then going just over like 60 point something. And that's the angle um, of rotation of the dish. And the, the dish is almost never go really at that angle. That's a, that's a really extreme angle. The whole structure is going to become really unstable. The other thing was um, it was a big storm that was happening in Australia around that geographical um, location. But they did it and I don't think there were any damages. We'll be right. GoldenEye, the Arecibo telescope scene.
Arecibo was the, the largest radio dish on the surface of the earth. And it was uh, a natural sinkhole uh, in uh, Puerto Rico uh, that was basically wired and that's what uh, creates a radio dish. And, and it was amazing. So the, the bigger the dish, the bigger the, the kind of the bucket that's gonna gather the photons of light. Right, so the, the bigger the dish, the more information, the higher the, the, the resolution, so basically the, the sharper the images uh, that we obtain with the telescopes are going to be. So I haven't unfortunately visited Arecibo and now it's too late because it's just not there anymore. About a year ago actually it was two cables that uh, kept the receiver on top of the big dish uh, broke and then in December the NSF National Science Foundation which was the main um, institution in charge of keeping it alive uh, decommissioned it. So yeah, it, it was amazing and actually Arecibo was the, the most important tool for searching for extraterrestrial life. It would give us the, the right bandwidth and, and the, uh, the resolution to detect signals from other possible extraterrestrial civilizations. He's getting ready to signal the satellite. So hopefully you're now convinced that the telescopes are, are tremendous fun to know about, to use, obviously. And I hope you all are keeping your eyes wide open for news coming from the uh, James Webb Space Telescope because there is just no way this telescope is not going to tell us things we've never knew before about our universe. Maybe the next movie is going to be about GWST maybe about its launch, movies with, with telescopes and movies with science in general.